Hello there, I'm Cartoon Karma. I've been doing this YouTube thing for a while now, doing this and that with animation and cartoons. It's been a lot of fun, but I've never really gotten into what might well be my other great passion, alongside animation, and that is... Pokemon. I've loved Pokemon, for as long as I can remember, it's probably fair to say that in one arm, I have the spectral souls of cartoon characters, and in the other, that of pocket monsters. That's not too morbid, right? Yet despite that, I've never done a Pokemon video. Guess I just thought, be it a cartoon channel, I just stick to cartoons. Something I've been watching a lot lately are Pokemon challenge videos. They're videos where someone plays through a Pokemon game with a self-imposed set of restrictions. The point of a challenge video is to play the game in a way the developers didn't intend. After all, you're supposed to build a party of six Pokemon that evolve and grow at you throughout your journey. Can you imagine trying to beat the game with a team of only baby Pokemon? Or in a Magikarp? Well, some kind folks out there have done just that. The Magikarp one was a no-go in red and blue, alas. And I have to say, I love these kind of videos. They're gripping, but in a pleasurable, relaxing way. So I figured, hey, why not try them myself? This is just a notion, but I got to thinking, what's a unique kind of Pokemon challenge I could do? And then, it hit me. Other than building a full team, the other thing you're supposed to do in Pokemon is battle a lot. Battling is the bread and butter of Pokemon gameplay, as vital as jumping is to Mario, or swinging a sword is to Link. What if we battled as ill as possible? Battling only those battles which are necessary to progress the game means you gain far less experience points, which makes major battles tougher as you're constantly underleveled. It's not just about the number at the end of it all either. Many major battles will be big obstacles. Since this has already been done for the Generation 1 Pokemon games, Red, Blue and Yellow, I decided to try it in the Generation 2 games. So that's the challenge. Today, everyone, we're going to find out what are the minimum number of battles to beat Pokemon Gold and Silver with no items. And yes, I do like making things tougher for myself. Before we start, let's cover some ground rules. Any trainer battle you engage in adds to the counter, while Pokemon don't count if you run away immediately. Battle or throw a Pokeball, and they count. Other than that, no items in battle are permitted, only held items and items outside of combat. This is just an agreed upon standard for these challenge videos. With items, there's plenty of easy ways to get past most battles. It strips a lot of the challenge out. This is also what makes this quite different from a speedrun. Lastly, no glitches or exploits, that's just uncool. I've done my research, but I'm still playing it blind, first time through. You're getting to see my initial attempt, and I'm writing this script as I go through with the challenge. Another standard with these kind of challenge videos. And remember, this is just a bit of fun, folks. So let's enjoy ourselves. The first thing to decide on is our starter. It's likely that who we pick will be our main battler for the whole game, as wild catches will add to the battle counter, gift Pokemon will be much weaker than our level, and we need every experience point we can get. Sadly, it's not Chikorita. Johto is notorious for grass being a poor type. Six gyms are bad matchups, and coupled with weaker grass attacks, many battles will be basically impossible at a lower level. Cyndaquil seems good on paper, but I checked the numbers, and turns out that if we don't start with Totodile, we have to battle a wild Pokemon and catch it to use Whirlpool for story progression later. Not complaining, I like Totodile, and the little guy looks as pumped as I am. I named him Stitch. I don't have my favourites. Our first battle isn't until we return home from a fetch quest and run into our rival. He stole the starter strongest against ours, Chikorita, but we're both at level 5, so it doesn't know a grass move yet. Victory's pretty set in stone, unless he gets a lucky critical hit. Amazingly, there's only one other trainer before the first gym, this youngster with a Pidgey and a Rattata. After beating them, we level up and learn Rage. The early part of Jota has some side quests you're supposed to do that aren't actually mandatory, so by skipping the Bellsprout Tower, we're at the first gym already, only two battles in! This trainer's Spearow hits hard, trying to use Scratch can't win the battle. But Rage works pretty well, as long as you use Rage continuously, it doubles in power every time you're hit by the opponent. By using it over and over, it gets strong enough to beat Spearow. However, Spearow can still beat you, depending on your DVs. It's a bit complex, but basically every Pokemon is given a number of 0 to 15 for every stat when the game first generates it. If my DVs were poor, I'd have to start the run over, or pray for a critical hit on a late Rage. Thankfully, they were good enough to survive on 1 HP. We can see on this guy's 2 Pidgey that Rage excels when the opponent starts with a weaker Pokemon, as it lets us build up power so when they send out the stronger foe, it's powerful enough to beat it quickly. This is basically the strategy for Faulkner, though oddly, he never used Mud Slap, his gimmick move that lowers accuracy alongside dealing damage, so he was easier than Spearow. I never would have thought that Totodon knowing Rage, normally a terrible attack because you have to keep using it to do anything good, would be the key here. Only 5 battles in and we have our first badge. Already the run's surprising us. There's only one trainer on Route 32, as we can avoid the rest by taking the Grass Pat rather than the Pier. Thankfully, there's a Pokemon Center right before Union Cave, much like with Mount Moon and Rock Tunnel in Gen 1. Good old nostalgia. 
Union Cave has two battles, and the first one could have been terrible, as it's a hiker with three Geodude, and we don't know Water Gun yet. Thankfully, it's weak enough that we can build up Rage on it. By the time the stronger Geodudes come out, our Rage is too powerful, as we make quick work of them. Also, we level up and learn Water Gun. Useful for the next trainer and his Vulpix. One thing to note, there are some trainers in the game that look back and forth constantly, and you have to run by when they're looking the other way to get by without battling. For these spinners, it's worth saving, in case it doesn't work. If they catch you, just reset and try again. No harm done. Before we can challenge the gym, we have to liberate Slowpoke well from Team Rocket. There are four grunts in here, and as is often the case with evil teams, they're largely a breeze. We managed to beat them without healing in between, which was nice. Kurt heals us when he takes us outside afterwards, which is doubly nice. Unlike in Violet, not all the trainers in Azalea Gym here are mandatory. After the twins, you can go left or right, one trainer either way. There's another spinning trainer to avoid before Bugsy. This time, I just went straight for the Rage strategy. Metapod and Kakuda hit for weak damage, and Rage equals Scratch's damage after we're hit once, and gets better for every hit after that, so it's better almost right away. Scyther has Fury Cutter, which also builds in power every turn, but it isn't dependent on being hit yourself. He missed the first time, so we easily swept him, but we would have won even if he'd hit. With the badge, we level up to level 18, and Totodile also evolves into Croconaw too. Nice! And this... is a choke point. Our rival Gantu is back, and he's packing a Bayleaf with a strong Razor Leaf. Normally we'd build up Rage on the prior Pokemon, except it's a Ghastly, and Ghosts aren't hit by normal moves. He always sends in Bayleaf next for the type advantage. There's no way we can build up Rage against it, Razor Leaf simply hurts us too much. It's his only damaging move too, so we can't hope it uses a different attack to power up our rage. Short of trying over and over until I got two consecutive critical hits, a 1 in 256 chance, we needed a different strategy. I considered using the Mudslap TM we got from Faulkner to lower its accuracy, but it's such a gamble. We need to use it multiple times, four times is statistically best, and then finish it solely with Scratch. And we can't get hit more than once, as even if we survive on a sliver, Zubat will finish us off. The odds are below 1% if he uses nothing but Razor Leaf. Thankfully, there is another way. We got Fury Cutter as a TM from Bugsy. Though similar to Rage, Fury Cutter can hit Ghosts, so after hitting Ghastly with one Water Gun, we can build up Fury Cutters on it. It uses lots of annoying moves, like Hypnosis to put us to sleep, so we took a few hits. But once Ghastly's down, we one-shot Bayleaf, and with Fury Cutter powered up four times, it's even strong enough to beat Zubat. That required outside-the-box thinking. TMs are very limited this early, so thank goodness we had Fury Cutter. It's not needed again, so Cut took its place to progress. Unfortunately, the move deleter isn't till the final gym, so we're stuck with Cut for a while. The route below Goldenrod has no required trainers, though you have to take a winding path through the grass to avoid their line of sight. Trial and error helps out here. Once we're at Goldenrod, there's tons of things to do. First, I pick up the bike from the bike shop, so we can move around quicker. We also buy the TM for Ice Punch, that'll be handy later. If it's Sunday, we can also get Return. Return gets more powerful the higher your friendship, up to 102 base power. It's not super strong now, but it will be later when we teach it. It's worth going to the underground, as there's two trainers you have to face later and we need all the experience we can get. Just make sure to enter from the north side. There are a few other things, but now it's gin time. It's a bit of a winding maze, but the only mandatory trainer is this last with a snubble. It's a little annoying, but not a problem. Whitney, on the other hand, we all remember Whitney, right? As kids, everyone always talked about how her milk tank is a huge threat, and it is at that age, but nowadays, a little smart preparation and grinding sorts her out. Of course, this is minimum battles, so we're stuck with a level 20 crocodile. It's the rage strategy again. Her Clefairy can be annoying, as it likes to use metronome to toss any move at us. Stas conditions can be a big pain if we get one of those. But if it's double slap, that's a gift from up above, because rage goes up in power every time we're hit, and it could hit up to 5 times at once. We end up facing Miltank with a Factor 3 Rage. It didn't use its deadly attract, and we thankfully didn't get flinched from Stomp, so Miltank fell, giving us a third badge and a new move in Bite. There's just a couple more things to do before leaving Goldenrod. In the North Gate, this guy gives us a Spearow to deliver back to before Violet City, but there's nothing stopping us from just not delivering it. A free flyer is really handy, we'll be able to backtrack super quick later. Gold and Silver are lucky in that there's enough gift Pokemon to cover all HMs that we never have to catch anything. Speaking of, in the game corner, we need to buy a user for strength. We only have enough money for half the 700 coins needed, so it's the slot machines it is. Gambling is bad, kids. Amazingly, I get a triple of my first spin. That's never happened before. Gleefully, I grind it to the 400 mark. We buy the remainder, giving us 700 coins to buy a Sandshrew. In gold, Ekans fits the bill instead. Now, normally in gold and silver, after you beat Whitney, you're supposed to use the squirt bottle to water the Sudowoodo to the north so it'll move. I actually did that, 
battling a few unavoidable traders along the way, and had to reset when Stitch was roared out. Twice. That was annoying. But after getting past Soda Widow, I noticed the shortcut back to Violet. If we go back to Violet the way we came, through Elex Forest and Union Cave, we can get past Soda Widow without having to battle any trainers. And since we can just run from the fake tree right away, it doesn't count as a battle. Awesome! Incidentally, this Soda Widow shortcut is one of several ways this isn't a speedrun. There, it'd be much quicker to battle a few trainers to get here from Goldenrod, not backtrack around the long way. A speedrun would also never get HM Pokemon at the game corner, they'd catch a wild one they ran into on the way. Not as big a change as no items in battle, but it does make it different. Now, the game kind of shifts here. Up to this point, we've been underleveled, because the game's been linear with little deviations, and lots of trainers can be skipped. But now the game opens up, with several things you can do in any order, and for a while, the density of mandatory trainers increases. It's an interesting change. There's only one trainer before Ecritique, so with 21 battles, we're already at the 4th gym. The 4 trainers in the gym aren't a big problem. The ghosts like to use annoying moves, but Bite makes quick work of them. Before we face Morhi, it's best to go to the Kimono Girl's house. We need to beat them to get Surf, both to progress and because it's a fantastic move, the only great HM in battle. They all use different evolutions, and they're generally easy. Even Jolteon is beatable without the flinch I got. Stitches a four shot to its Thundershock. Once that's done with, and we've learned Surf, we're ready to give Morty a try. Ghastly falls right away, but the rest all take two shots. Hunter drops a curse on us before it falls, but thankfully you don't take recurring turn damage if you take a knockout. It's no Hyper Beam not recharging in Gen 1 quirk, but it's something. Both Gengar and the second Haunter were two shots, and neither of them damaged us, so we only lost half our health to curse. Half the badges down with only 31 battles, and really close to evolving. At this point in the run, we're at a fork. We can go left to Olivine City, or we can go right to Mahogany Town. What would be ideal would be to go left, battle all essential trainers other than the gym leaders, and then do the same to the right, before tackling the gyms. Unfortunately, there's a trainer right before Olivine that you can avoid on the way, but not the way back. The only way to get past that trainer later is to get Fly after beating Chuck. Basically, if we go left, we can't backtrack until beating Chuck, and it's best to evolve before that. So I decided to go right, though either strategy is viable. Amazingly, we can get all the way to Lake of Rage without battling a single trainer. Unlike with Soda Wudo, we have to battle the Red Gyarados, you can't run away. This thing is powerful, and required in our alternate strategy. We had to lead with our other three Pokemon, and let it beat them all with trash, then send out Stitch to chip away at it while it took some confusion damage. On my second try, it worked, as Gyarados hit itself twice and didn't use trash afterwards. We also pick up our first rare candy in the hedge maze here. And here, the game becomes kind of a breeze, and not just because we evolve in our next battle. This is common to Johto runs, there are several different quests you have to do after the fort badge, and because you can do them in any order, they're all level adjusted as if they're the first one you do. To give you an example, the Rocket Hideout has 11 trainers and 3 electrode you have to fight. I fought all of them without healing my health or PP once for an extra challenge. I even beat the last electrode with 4 HP and on a double bite flinch as I'd ran out of surf, just for a bit of added tension. Other than turning off the security switch on the first floor and avoiding the wild traps in a grunt by going around the lawn way and avoiding this grunt here, the rest is straightforward. You have to fight everyone. Simple quest, moving on. Something that I never knew, because I always battle all trainers usually, is that you can skip all trainers in Price's gym. Just need to skate past this guy before he looks at you. There's nothing to Price, bite for the water types and surf on Piloswine. Now that we're a bit stronger, we head to Olivine. As noted earlier, we can avoid all trainers on the route there. In the lighthouse, we only have to fight three trainers, though I make sure to drop down from the top floor to pick up a rare candy, surf to Cyanwood by hugging the seawall, occasionally curving to avoid a trainer. Disclaimer time. Remember what I said earlier about buying a sand tree to use strength for? Yeah, it turns out I completely forgot a guy here gives you shuckle. Grinding briefly for coins and spending money earlier wasn't necessary at all. It's okay though. We're earning money fast enough for the second Pokemon we need to buy at the game corner. By this level, we're high enough that even missing two cuts on this Hitmonlee or being paralyzed and taking two thunder punches from this Hitmonchan barely hindered us. Chuck's Polyrath could have been an issue, using Mind Reader to make Dynamic Punch always land a confuse, but it never came to pass. We used Togepi to reduce his attack stat and finished him off from there. With Fly now, we flew back to Olivine and gave Jasmine a whirl. I didn't heal between Chuck and her, hoping for a mild challenge. Did we get it? Nope. The Magnemites didn't even get a chance to get off Thunderbolt or Thunder Wave, and the Steelix was a total sweep. Now, this is only easy both because we're slightly overleveled due to hogging all the experience to one Pokemon, and because we evolved into Feraligare so early. If it evolved at the normal level 36 for a starter's final form, these battles would have been mildly challenging. 
Never really understood why Gen 2 upended the starter evolution levels like that, and Jasmine and Chuck would have been harder had I done them first. Not much to say on the radio tower, we face 21 trainers, and not even the executives are of note. With our new Ice Punch, I forgot to teach it earlier but there weren't any battles that would have changed, even our rivals of Breeze. In red and blue, there are only 68 mandatory battles, and we're already past that. Most rockets could be skipped in those games, but here, nearly all are mandatory, and that inflates our level. The game was designed for relaxed playing with a full party. I got so complacent, I neglected to save frequently and ran into a spinning trainer after the side quest, and had to reset and do four battles. Not the last time that happened either. Fun fact, did you know Gen 2 is the highest percentage of new Pokemon that kept their Japanese names? Out of 100 Pokemon, 31 are named identically. I always find it interesting which Pokemon require name changes to have the meaning translate, so it's kind of fitting the region with the most Japanese influence kept the most species names for its batch of pocket monsters. There's only one trainer before the ice path, and once we're true, onto Blackthorn Gym. Only one trainer here can be skipped, but with Ice Punch for the Dragons and Slash for everyone else, Claire has gotten too quickly. As you might expect, her tree Dragonairs fall to Ice Punch, and Kendra gets some stolen moves and damage off, but falls without too much trouble. This is the second complacent moment I was talking about. I ran into a spinner later and had to redo this battle, and Kendra felt even easier that time. Lesson learned, kids. Always save your game. All the gyms are beat, but we have a few things to do before heading off to the Pokemon League. The move deleter's in town, so we can finally get rid of Cut and replace it with Whirlpool to go into the Dragon's Den and get Claire to actually give us the badge. At this point, we've more than enough money for a Jatini, so we buy the necessary coins and get it in Goldenrod, teaching at Waterfall. Before leaving Johto, it's best to grab the remaining rare candies for later. Two are in easy surf locations below Goldenrod and in Violet City, but two others are in dark caves in the World Islands and Mount Mortar. Flash isn't available on a minimum battle run, so it's best to just follow a guide, or my on-screen map. Thankfully, both are pretty close when you enter the right entrance. That's the last time we'll leave Whirlpool, so after deleting it from Stitch, it's off to Kanto. There's another rare candy right after we cross over. Most trainers can be surfed around, so this part only adds 5 battles before we reach Victory Road, a super condensed version of Gem 1's Victory Road. Isn't it so weird this place is empty and truncated? Kanto really was added late in development. Other than picking up the Earthquake TM, there's nothing of note. That Onyx looks really sick. Both sick as in good, and sick as in actually sick. Seriously, this is really rare. There's no way to reduce shiny odds of over 8,000 in Gen 2. And now, it's lost to the limbo of generated data. Sorry Shiny Onyx, you're not worth all the time I put into this. Compared to that putrid looking but cool rock snake, the final battle with our rival Gantu was sedate in comparison. Brigadium lived long enough to put up a reflect, so I just used special moves for the rest of his team. Before we tackle the Pokemon League, I fly back to Goldenrod and pick up Return, since it's Sunday now. We've been playing long enough for Max Friendship, so I replace Slash with Return. It's nearly 50% more powerful. Well worth the trade-off of a normal critical hit ratio, after slapping Earthquake onto our moveset, let's do this! Given Stitch's wide moveset, Will was a total sweep. Ice Punch took out both Zatus and severely weakened Executor, and Return pummeled the rest. We got hit with Leaf Seed, but since recurring damage doesn't occur on knockout turns, it only chipped at us against Slowbro. A Super Potion cured our minor woes before Koga. Ariados barely hung on from Surf, but only put up a double team before falling. Venomot missed the Toxic, as enemy AI has a chance to miss status moves, which is great for us. After it fainted, Surf took out Fortress, Earthquake annihilated much, and Ice Punch took out Crobat despite a Toxic on the last round, an antidote and another Super Potion set us off for Bruno. Him on top his poor attacking moves and used Dig, which was fine as Earthquake hits underground foes and does double damage. Him on Chan already got off a Thunder Punch before fainting. Him on Lee has atrocious defense, yet it barely hung on from Earthquake. Should have used a turn, it's an inch more powerful. Matt Champ dealt decent damage for a cross chop. But after our first surf, Bruno wasted a turn heal with Max Potion, only to be knocked back down again. He wisely didn't bother a second time. With surf atomizing Olix, we healed slightly again and pressed on to Karen. Umbreon is quite bulky, able to live 3 hits, but it only confused and then chipped its stitch with faint attack and we got past confusion both times. The third time we weren't so lucky, but Vileplume's stun spore missed. It missed again after one ice punch. We were just on fire here, despite being, you know, a water type. Earthquake for Gengar, Ice Punch for Murkrow, and Surf for Houndoom finish her off. Even with the level gap closing, it's easy to see why for Alligator nails Gen 2. It nails it enough that I got a bit cocky. Cocky enough that I didn't heal for Champion Lance. Gyarados really went for Surf, which barely scratched Stitch, and it fell after another return. Two Dragonite fell to Ice Punches, but his strongest one just barely survived and heavily hurt us with Outrage. 
enough that Aerodactyl, outspeeding us, used Hyper Beam to end us? Well, that was reckless. After healing and trying again, Gyarados used an equally baffling flail to similarly poor results. Yet again, the final Dragonite barely held on where its brothers fell, but this time, it wasted a safeguard. Real smart, Lance. Aerodactyl's Hyper Beam didn't wreck us this time, and Surf took out it and the following Jarzard. And there you have it! The minimum number of battles to beat the champion is 94. Even the Elite Four wasn't much trouble, for Alligator is just that good. It's telling all our slip-ups were due to me being conservative about healing, but as I'm sure you all know, the game isn't over yet. We have Kanto to go through, as well as a secret final boss that will turn the tables on us, over leveling us by a fair distance. Hopefully our own medicine won't taste bad. Before we head off to Kanto, cut is needed again, so teach it to Sandshrew, buying it if you didn't yet. If you're playing in gold, Ekans can't learn it, so dart back to Blackthorn and remove one of Alligator's move to reteach cut. Don't worry, cut isn't needed for long, and once you're moving towards the final boss, remove it and reteach the old move again. There's only one sailor on the SS Ack where we have to fight. Once you reach Kanto, it whips by fast. Not only are enemy levels around Blackthorn levels, with the gym leaders being weak Elite 4 members at best, but there are only 22 more trainers to battle at this point. Eight of them gym leaders? You can clear Surge and one of three trainers of Vermilion, just Sabrina and Saffron, and Erica and three trainers in Celadon. The only notable group of trainers is seven weaklings on Nugget Bridge Mark II north of Cerulean. With all these crossed off, we have less than 10 trainers left. There's no point in recapping any of these battles. Using a super effective move, or Surf Sash Return when there isn't one, and we sweep almost everyone. I only healed after taking some solar beam damage from Erica's Blossom. That said, there are things one has to be careful with. The first is that we have to go to the power plant twice to eventually get to the blocked off parts of Kanto. We're supposed to go east from Cerulean, but that involves extra trainers. To keep to minimum battles, we have to go to Rock Tunnel. Without Flash. Make sure to stock up on repels. It's worth it though, we only fight one hiker this way, while otherwise there's several due to how tight Route 9 is. No shame in using a map here. Once true, we talk to the guy, go back to Cerulean, bump into this renegade rocket in the gym, find Misty at the Cape, then battle her. Another cakewalk battle, but afterwards we get the machine part. We have to go to Rock Tunnel the second time to return it, but once we do we can get the Poke Flute channel and wake up the Snorlax block in Dignit's Cave. It doesn't count as a battle as we just run away. From there we can sweep the remaining gym leaders. Brock, Blaine and Janine all fall like paper. The reason we left Janine until now is because you have to approach Fuchsia from this side, the other parts all require additional trainers. That's the second thing to be careful with. It's commonly held in Gen 2 Pokemon challenges that Blue is the only Kanto gym leader of note. That's sort of true, he gets some hits in at least, but he was still a sweep. Pidgeot barely scratches us before it falls, and Exeggutor wastes time on a solar beam, Alakazam is so frail it falls too. We have no super effective moves against Gyarados, so it's a tree shot and lowers us to half health. But Ride on an Arcanine fall easily, we barely outspell Alakazam there. It could have set up a reflect that might have caused some problems, but it was fine. Before we move on to Red, there's four more rare candies to pick up, one from the fan club chairman in Vermilion, one hidden in Silabar Island, and one on Route 28 by Mount Silver. The last one is in Tin Tower back in Ecrotique City. If playing Silver, pick up the Rainbow Wing in Pewter City, but in Gold, you already have it. Once you've nabbed it on the fifth floor, that's 11 rare candies. If Raligator still knows Cut, it can be deleted now. Red's finally a higher level against us, and has six Pokemon to one so there's no doubt our easy streak since the Red Gyarados is about to come to a crashing ult. Let's see by how much. I try it without the rare candies first, and after defeating Pikachu with Earthquake, we get a lucky freeze on Venusaur and finish it off. But after that, there's no helping it. Espeon outspeeds us and lands powerful psychics. Well, that didn't work, but no harm in a scouting battle. I spend all my money on vitamins to boost my stats. We're only able to use tree in each stat before we hit the limit. I feed the rare candies in, boosting Stitch to level 73, and give it an air try. Similar results, Venusaur always goes for either Solar Beam or a Sunny Day. Best strategy here is to switch it to something else. If Solar Beam, we switch back after it takes the blow. If Sunny Day, we stack 4 Pokemon to stall it out. Ice Punch can be a 2 shot or a 3 shot, depending on the damage roll, but it tries to set up again anyway, so no problem. We speed tie with Espeon, but I strangely outsped it every try, so either I flubbed the mat or I got super lucky. Either way, we get past it only taking one hit. Snorlax is a tree shot with return. It always uses Amnesia first, but it always lands us into the orange with a body slam before we finish it. Blastoise is another tree shot, and it chips us into the red with Surfs. With Charizard, we knock it down to a sliver before it finishes us off. We're so close. I did this battle several times, and it's always the same. We're not dependent on damage rolls or getting a freeze, and we have other party members to stall out Sunny Day or reflect from Espeon, a crit from our opponent or gain paralyzed from Snorlax's body slam, 
or both, ruins our day, but that's rare enough bad luck to accept. Yet Surf never finishes his Charizard off, it's just outside the damage range. Getting a crit on either of the first two hits on Snorlax or Blastoise, or on Charizard or Espeon, would do it, but that's a 1 in 16 chance for each, and with no bad luck to that point. The odds of none of those six attacks being crits is 67.89%, still too high. And that's okay odds, but I want us to be able to have a consistent way to finish this. The whole run's been very stable. It'd be a shame if the final battle could only be passed by a low odds dice roll. Thing is, we're at an impasse here. We can't battle anyone else or improve our stats. Like with the rival battle back in Azalea Town, I got to thinking, what could we change about our moveset? Since Earthquake was only being used on Pikachu, I curiously tried to see whether a return would knock it out. It did? Good for us that Pikachu's defenses are paper thin. That gives us a spare move slot. Our main obstacles are Blastoise and Snorlax, as they take 3 hits to beat and deal the most damage. There's no grass or electric moves here for Blastoise. But for Snorlax... Nah, I'm just kidding. The dynamic punch strategy for Snorlax does work, but it only has the 50% chance to hit. I got a first try, but I'd prefer a more consistent victory. Rest is the answer. We're at low health when reaching Blastoise, but it only does 40-ish damage every turn. Perfect place to heal up, and even after being asleep for two turns, we're healthy enough to finish off Blastoise and Charizard with Surf. And with that, we have beaten Red! In the rear 117 battles, 94 for the main campaign, 23 for Kanto, we've beaten Pokemon Gold and Silver, and all without using items in battle or any glitches or exploits. That final battle may have been the only difficult part for a while, but it delivered in the right way, requiring several adjustments for the right strategy, but said strategy turned out reliable and sturdy. It's another big reason why this isn't a speedrun. Their strategy of X items makes the approach to red night and day different. On top of that, I never used health items in battle either, even though it was allowed. Healing with leftovers is another way to breed red consistently, as despite taking a body slam from Snorlax, we heal half our health over the course of the battle, more than enough to get past Charizard, but I wanted to see if we could do it without that. And we did. I have to say, this run was a lot of fun. Normally when I play Pokemon games, I'm a Pokedex fiend, so it was such a massive shift going from that to finishing the game with only 8 in the Pokedex and in just under 8 hours. It felt super weird, but also really fresh. The lengths we went to to avoid battles were pretty wacky. Backtracking to Violet to get past Soda Wudo, flying to avoid trainers that were mandatory when backtracking, and going through Rock Tunnel Blind twice. You don't see that every day. This runs super consistent already, but just because I don't see potential improvements doesn't mean they're not there. By all means, tell me if you spot some. So, from here, where to next? Perhaps a minimum battles run for Crystal? It's mostly the same, but there are some battles where you need a totally different plan, and more trainers can be skipped in that game, so it's a slimmer number. It wouldn't be a whole video like this one, more of an extra part just highlighting the changes. I'll give that one a whirl if there's enough interest. Past that, I'd be very interested in doing other Pokemon challenges. This one was good, but it was only mildly difficult. Some harder ones would be nice. I have a few in mind already, but let me know on Twitter, Facebook, and down below in the comments what you'd like to see. Comments do help the YouTube algorithm make the video find its way to more people and ghosts alike, after all. Perhaps you'll suggest ideas I hadn't even considered. If you want to see more from me, I've done lots of videos on various cartoons, with more to come. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss anything. Hopefully in the future there'll be a playlist of all my Pokemon challenges handy, so if you want to watch more, check that out too. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and Facebook, I'd love to hear how you found the channel. Thanks a lot for watching the video, and have a corking day! Until next time, folks.